Welcome back to Remake or Rebreak, Metroid 2 Revisited. In the last episode, I gave my updated thoughts on another Metroid 2 remake, or AM2R for short. We're going to wrap up this series of videos by looking at Nintendo's official remake of Metroid 2, Samus Returns for the Nintendo 3DS. As noted last time, Samus Returns was Nintendo's belated answer to the Federation Force controversy, entering development sometime in 2015. Evidently, series producer Yoshio Sakamoto had been trying to bring the series back for many years, but needed a suitable developer for the project. And, because so many people have commented on this, Yes, I am making a good faith effort to pronounce Sakamoto-san's name as accurately as I can. Sakamoto. If you're a Japanese speaker, feel free to correct me, but please know that I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. Anyway, Sakamoto eventually found a partner in Mercury Steam, the Spanish studio behind Castlevania Lords of Shadow, one of my favorite games of all time. Speaking of which, I should really get around to reviewing it someday, wink wink. Anyways, the partnership between Sakamoto and Mercury Steam brought the series back, and eventually led to Metroid Dread, now popularly considered one of the best games in the franchise. So, regardless of what I feel about Samus Returns as a game, I'm definitely glad it happened. At the time, however, I was mixed on the reveal of Samus Returns. On one hand, Lords of Shadow 2 was a fun but flawed 3D Metroidvania, and I was curious to see what Mercury Steam could do with Metroid itself. On the other hand, considering AM2R existed and was everything I wanted out of a Metroid 2 remake, an official remake of Metroid 2 couldn't help but seem too little too late. Nevertheless, I picked up a copy on launch day to support the franchise. Samus Returns was generally well regarded by fans and critics, and ostensibly sold well enough for Nintendo to greenlight Metroid Dread. As for me, I wasn't particularly impressed, and I wasn't the only one. Anecdotally, people I know seem to be all over the map. I know one person who dislikes it, another who liked it but never finished it for whatever reason, and others who really enjoyed it. While I may not have enjoyed it that much in my first playthrough, I'm always willing to give a game a critical reappraisal. I hated Kingdom Hearts 2 the first time I played it, but on a second playthrough I found that it was much better than I remembered. Sometimes you just don't get a game the first time through. On the other hand, I'm not going to sugarcoat my criticisms to maintain some arbitrary positivity quota. I love Metroid, and the only way it can improve is if I stay honest. Today I want to answer three questions. First, how will the Samus Returns recreate and improve upon the original Metroid 2? Second, how does Samus Returns control contrast with AM2R. Finally, what do I think of Samus Returns as a game on its own? With all that said, this is Samus Returns Remake or Rebreak. The story hews close to the original Metroid 2, with a few important exceptions. The game opens with a cinematic slideshow summarizing the events of Zero Mission and the lead-up to Metroid 2. The research team and rescue team from the Game Boy Manual are combined into a single Federation expedition. While aware of the threat the Metroid Menace poses to the galaxy, the Galactic Federation Council contracts bounty hunter Samus Aran to destroy all the Metroids living on SR388. From here, the story follows the Game Boy version in broad strokes, but has a number of notable changes. First, the way Metroid's time to progression has been tweaked slightly. One of my favorite bits of environmental storytelling from the original was the use of earthquakes as progression gates to block the player's progress. While there's no official explanation within the game itself, my interpretation was that the queen was responsible. Killing the queen's offspring caused her to lash out in grief and rage, thus triggering the earthquakes throughout the game. Meanwhile, Samus Returns establishes that the Chozo deliberately flooded their complex with this purple liquid to trap the Metroids in the underground cave systems. Now, Samus must collect DNA strands to disable these Chozo seals, lower the liquid, and descend deeper into the planet. While this changes virtually nothing in terms of gameplay, the Chozo seals take away the mystery and intrigue of the original. Sometimes, it's more engaging to put the pieces of a mystery together for yourself and find your own interpretation. What's more, it makes the ring trap in Area 6 considerably less tense, since you know that the only reason you're trapped there is because the Chozo Chozo deliberately designed the seals that way for some reason. Even AM2R, which added a catalog of flavor text to read throughout the game, leaves a lot of what the Chozo were actually doing on SR388 up to the player's own interpretation. Speaking of the Chozo, the next thing you'll discover is that, like AM2R, Samus Returns has reimagined the temples from the original game as various Chozo facilities. There's a temple, a hydro dam, a mine, a crystal cavern, a grassy tower, a desert, a laboratory, and the Queen's Nest. For whatever 
whatever reason, however, these areas are still referred to as Area 1, Area 2, Area 3, rather than something distinct like Norfair, Fendrana, or Cataris. It doesn't really matter, but it does tend to make Samus Returns feel more video gamey than other installments. While reimagining the later temples definitely adds some much appreciated visual variety, some of the more iconic environments from the original have been tossed out and overwritten. For example, the Gamma Nest under Area 3 used to be this jungle-like hive area. The equivalent of this area in Samus Returns just looks like a bunch of generic caverns, to the point that I almost didn't recognize this area from the original at all. Similarly, the Bubbly Omega Nest from the original, which highlighted through the visuals just how intensely the Metroids had transformed their surroundings, has been reimagined as a Chozo laboratory. The result is that this version of SR388 often feels unrecognizable from the original. Later, the plot diverges somewhat from the Game Boy version. For one, the Federation Expedition does make an appearance at the beginning of the game, unlike the original. While exploring Area 3, Samus reactivates a Chozo mining robot, the Diggernaut. At first, the robot doesn't seem interested in Samus and leaves her in peace. The Diggernaut later reappears in Area 4, engaging Samus in a harrowing chase and only leaving when it believes Samus is dead. The robot later steals the power bombs in Area 6, only relinquishing it after fighting Samus to the bitter end in a multi-phase battle. Its desperate mannerisms and sudden heel turn imply that the Diggernaut is self-aware and determined to stop Samus from completing her mission. If you've played Fusion, you can probably speculate, but I appreciate that the Diggernaut's motivation is left up to the player's interpretation. The Diggernaut adds some gray morality to the story and helps to set up plot points from later games without being too much of a retcon. Eventually, Samus comes across the Metroid Hatchling, and this is one area where Samus Returns stands above the other two versions. Despite being possibly the most important moment in the entire series, the original Game Boy cutscene doesn't exactly sell it. The hatchling just starts following you and for some reason, you can't shoot it. This was later retconned slightly in the flashback in Super Metroid, where Samus's body language is a little more developed. Fast forward to Samus Returns, and the presentation has vastly improved, with multiple camera angles and POV shots. The scene manages to communicate a flurry of complex emotions entirely through the visuals, with Samus ultimately lowering her weapon and forging an emotional connection. It's a beautiful scene, and I give it all the credit in the world. Seeing as this game is still fairly new, here's a final warning for endgame sports. Spoilers. Use the chapter system at the bottom of the screen to skip ahead to the next chapter if you don't want spoilers. In the original, in AM2R, finding the hatchling transitions into an Aetherius romp back to your ship. In Samus Returns, this section is now filled with enemies and new expansions to collect. Samus and the hatchling make their way back to Samus's ship, but are ambushed by Ridley, a plot point unique to Samus Returns. I know that some fans hate this change, seeing as it arguably undermines the tone of the original ending by devolving into action schlock. As for me, I'd argue that including Ridley adds more than dumb fan service. We get to see Samus and the hatchling fight desperately against a common enemy and save each other in the process. It strengthens the bond between the two characters, and better informs Samus's motivation to retrieve the Hatchling in Super Metroid. Samus wasn't just trying to stop the pirates from producing bioweapons, she was trying to save someone special to her. Besides, this is probably the best Ridley fight in the entire franchise. The attack set is tricky to dodge and evolves throughout the fight, the mid-fight cutscenes are exciting even if they run at 20 FPS, and it manages to be challenging without being ridiculous like hard mode Mecha Ridley in Zero Mission. My only complaint is that power bombs and missiles are completely useless against him, meaning that collecting all the missile tanks provides no advantage for the final boss whatsoever. Just keep that in mind for when we circle back to full completion. On top of the new ending, Samus Returns includes a gallery of Chozo memories, which you unlock by collecting expansions in the story. These showcase what happened to the Chozo in the moments leading up to them abandoning SR388. We see everything. Ian and energy harvesting, the onslaught of the X, the creation of the Metroids, and the height of Chozo civilization. When the Metroids unexpectedly mutate from Aeon exposure, however, they spiraled out of control, which led the Chozo to erect the seals we see throughout the game. We also see a sign of Chozo infighting when a rogue group eliminates the Chozo on SR388. I suspected that this would remain an unsolved mystery in the series, but as it turns out, we wouldn't have to wait long for an explanation. More on that in later videos. Beating the game also shows a brief post credit scene where an ex-parasite attacks a Hornode, setting up Metroid Fusion.
Moving on, it's time to talk about Pixels for the 551st time. As before, I'm playing on a loopy 3DS capture card with proper scaling and all that jazz. Now, some of you might be asking, what about new 3DS? Unfortunately, Katsu Kitty went out of business, kits are basically extinct, and pre-modded systems are very expensive. There is a program called Snickerstream that can stream the new 3DS to PC. Unfortunately, this compresses each frame into a lossy JPEG and can't deliver more than 40 FPS, no matter how much I lower the quality. I will discuss new 3DS differences, but for the sake of presentation, all the footage comes from an original 3DS. Okay, quick editor's note. While I'm in the middle of editing this review, Loopy released his long-awaited new 3DS Excel capture board. The stock has already sold out, of course, but I'll try to get one for the next time I review a 3DS game. I want to stress that while gameplay is absolutely the most important factor for an action-adventure game like this, over the past 20 years, the Metroid series became a generational touchstone to showcase the latest and greatest visuals Nintendo had to offer, a trend that continued into the Wii era. Case in point, Metroid Dread is one of the most visually impressive games on the Nintendo Switch. That's why it disappoints me to say that the graphics in Samus Returns are below average by 3DS standards. I mean, I guess it looks better than the 3D graphics in the Fire Emblem games, but that's not saying much. I should be clear that I wasn't expecting next-gen HD visuals. This is a 3DS game, after all, and Mercury Steam had to work within those limitations. I actually remember being really impressed with the 3DS back in 2011, but from 2017 to 2019, in a time where the Switch already existed, continuing to release games in 240p couldn't help but seem wildly out of date. That said, I can point to many first-party 3DS games that transcend the hardware and deliver visuals with a lasting appeal. These games make up for the low resolution, texel density, and poly count with a quality art direction that plays well with the limitations. After examining the graphics closer, the biggest problem with Samus Returns is that the environments look straight out of a 1998 Nintendo 64 game. I can excuse the limited poly count, but even by 3DS standards, many of the textures in this game look exceptionally blurry and crusty. The result is a picture that is too smeary and too blocky at the same time. Compare this to, say, Kirby Triple Deluxe. That game came out in 2014 and still looks good, thanks to its bright colors, stylized visuals, and a lower level of detail and the textures. Speaking of which, for a remake of a black and white game, the color in Sam's Returns isn't even very good. Despite the series' focus on atmosphere, Metroid historically employed a bright palette of vibrant contrasting tones. There are a few environments in Sam's Returns where the color really pops, such as the surface, area 4, and the superheated rooms. The rest of the environments tend to look drab and desaturated, with little contrast and humor saturation. Nowhere is this better demonstrated than the purple liquid caves, which make up easily one-fifth of the game by themselves. Samus Returns also uses post-processing shaders, which are technically impressive for 3DS, but for the most part, they actually make the graphics look worse. Many areas use a combination of rendering fog and a tinting shader, which wash out the colors and greatly reduce the contrast. There's also some kind of bloom effect around everything, but the effect is so low res that it results in flickering and these squares that look like MPEG blocks blocking artifacts. I swear, it's not my footage, the game actually looks like this. In case you're wondering, yes, all of these issues are clearly visible on an actual 3DS screen. I could go on, but at the end of the day, visuals are subjective and you either agree with me or you don't. I've met plenty of folks who like the graphics in this game, and that's fine. It's not my job to tell you what to think, but rather to offer my own opinion and explain my thought process. In the interest of fairness, I'll name some positives. For the most part, I dig the underlying art direction for the characters, environments, and props. The 3D redesigns for all the enemies are a nice update from their Game Boy ancestors, and the revamped Metroid mutations look appropriately monstrous and grotesque. Samus's design is a nice middle ground between Zero Mission and Other M, and her movements and mannerisms are spot on. The other character models generally look good, with a respectable poly count and appropriately detailed textures. I especially enjoyed the look of the opening cutscene in the Chozo Memories Gallery. They're a nice update on the comic book aesthetic from Zero Mission. And I really wish the whole game looked like this. Referring back to Part 1, 
You might remember that I was critical of the backgrounds in the Game Boy version for being mostly empty black voids. Samus Returns takes advantage of the 3D graphics to create the most detailed, depthful backgrounds in any Metroid game so far. There are so many interesting details that I never noticed in my first playthrough, like these giant lizards in Area 2, this giant slug in Area 6, these beating hearts in Area 5, and this mysterious face in Area 4. Thanks to these backgrounds, the stereoscopic 3D in Samus Returns is quite possibly the best of any game on the 3DS. Unfortunately, I can't really show it to you on YouTube, seeing as the loopy cards still don't support 3D recording even after all this time. Suffice it to say, the scenery has a lot of depth and background detail that you can't really appreciate unless you turn the 3D on. But then again, I couldn't really appreciate that at first, seeing as the stereoscopic 3D on the original 3DS makes me feel like I'm going cross-eyed. That's why I definitely recommend playing this game on new 3DS. Samus Returns feels like a completely different game in super stable 3D. Even on new 3DS, Samus Returns still caps out at 30 FPS, making it one of four Metroid games not to run at a full 60. I understand that frame rate is something that you either notice or you don't, but 60 FPS is a huge part of why previous games felt so fluid and responsive, and part of what made those games so much fun to play. Running at 30 FPS, Samus Returns can't help but feel sluggish compared to previous games. With all that said, I will gladly accept except a mostly stable 30 FPS over the variable frame rates from Mercury Steam's previous projects. Their last 3DS project, Lords of Shadow, Mirror of Fate, struggled to maintain a consistent 30 FPS for nearly the entire game. While Samus Returns actually runs in the same engine, the frame rate is much more stable and consistent. Nevertheless, the game occasionally suffers performance drops in the original 3DS, particularly when going through certain doors or moving too fast through large environments. Personally, I'm willing to look past it, since it never significantly hampered the gameplay. What's more, these performance drops largely disappear when playing on new 3DS. Bottom line, the visuals in Samus Returns definitely have their upsides, but even in 2017, I was begging for an HD remaster that will probably never happen. After all, Mirror of Fate cleaned up decently well in HD, so why not? With graphics covered, I mixed on the soundtrack as well. Most Metroid games from Super Metroid onward were composed by Kenji Yamamoto, Minako Hamano, or both, sometimes with collaborators. Again, I'm trying to pronounce both of those names as accurately as I can. Yamamoto. Thankfully, both of these storied composers come back for Samus Returns. Sort of. Yamamoto is credited as music director, while Hamano is credited as sound coordinator. Now, I have no idea what these roles entailed. Nintendo has never released an official track list for Samus Returns saying who composed or arranged what. Either way, music and arrangement in Samus Returns is credited to Daisuke Matsuoka, who previously worked with Yamamoto and Hamano on the Returns games. I want to be clear that I have nothing against Matsuoka. Apparently, Matsuoka may have worked in some of the boss themes for Tropical Freeze, which were all really good. I just find the use of Yamamoto and Hamano an odd choice. Regardless, I live in this timeline, and with repeated listens, I've come to appreciate Matsuoka's soundtrack a lot more. For one thing, it sounds appropriately Metroid, which is important after the featureless action movie Dross from Other M. It features a similar soundscape to the Prime Choji and is dripping with atmosphere and ambiance. It's haunting ethereous, and unnerving. And that's exactly what I want from a Metroid score. If Yamamoto at least supervised the music, then you can definitely see his fingerprints on the finished product. But the actual composition in Samus Returns is kind of mixed. My favorite tracks from the original game are also my favorites here, with Matsuoka's arrangement of Surface of SR388 being my favorite so far. The one purely original track that I've really come to appreciate is the Area 2 theme. It's nothing special, but I'm partial to bass guitar. When Matsuoka remixes music from previous games, it's generally pretty good. The arrangement of the Super Metroid theme in Area 7 is pretty unique and fits the Chozo Laboratory surprisingly well. Strangely, however, existing themes tend to get thrown out and overwritten with new pieces. For example, Metroid 2 has a unique fanfare for loading a save that only appears in that game and aim to war.
In Samus Returns, they replaced it with the one from the NES game. Even Stranger is the Arachnus boss, which received a dedicated theme in Metroid Fusion. This track was later remixed for the Berserker Lord in Corruption. Unsurprisingly, the Arachnus reprises its role in Samus Returns, but is given a completely original boss theme. For some reason, the actual Arachnus boss theme has been handed over to the Diggernaut instead, specifically the Berserker Lord arrangement. This theme actually fits the Diggernaut really well, but given that Arachnus is still in the game, it strikes me as an odd choice regardless. Meanwhile, the original Metroid boss theme has been replaced entirely. Each of the four mutations get a brand new theme instead. At first, I didn't care for them too much since they kind of reminded me of Other M, but over five playthroughs, I grew to appreciate them a lot more. The Queen's Boss theme is also completely original, but upon repeat listens, it became one of my favorite tracks in the game. If you listen closely to the choral chanting, you can kind of make out the boss theme from the original game, but I'm really not sure. My point being that if the Game Boy boss themes are even in this game, they're basically unrecognizable. By contrast, the soundtrack gives us a clear remix of this gem. That's the problem with most of the soundtrack in Samus Returns. Too much of it comes off as ambient noise with no musical structure, and that's what generally comes to mind when I think of the soundtrack in this game. While ambient-focused music isn't necessarily a bad thing, my favorite Metroid soundtracks, Prime, Zero Mission, Super, are a skillful marriage of atmosphere and melody, to the point that it sounds like the environment itself is making the music. Like the Game Boy soundtrack, Samus Returns excels at nailing atmosphere or melody individually, but rarely attempts to combine them to positive effect. Part of me feels like I'm being too harsh, so I'll leave it at this. The soundtrack in Samus Returns is good when it's good, and and it's the best official Metroid soundtrack since Prime 3. But there are plenty of other Metroid soundtracks I'd rather listen to before I go back to this one. While it might seem like I've been pretty negative so far, Samus Returns only goes up from here. Starting with core gameplay, this is precisely the return to form the series needed, especially after Prime 3 and Other M linearized the design. In terms of basic control, Samus retains her zero mission moveset up to and including ledge aiming. Regardless, there are some changes to Samus's basic movement. As it turns out, the morph ball is less bouncy like it was in AM2R, which makes it a good choice for moving fast through downward shafts while making you a small 
smaller target. The spider ball returns from the original and now conveniently uses the L button like the Prime games. In Samus Returns, however, you can perform a new technique called the Spider Boost by attaching to a surface and laying a power bomb. It's a great substitute for the Shine Spark and I'd like to see it return in future games. Speaking of which, a host of upgrades from Super Metroid have been added to Samus Returns, including power bombs, super missiles, the grapple beam, and the gravity suit. We're off to a good start, but there are a couple downsides to the controls. Right off the bat, the movement physics aren't quite as tight and responsive as they were in Zero Mission. I'm not sure how much of that is the actual programming, and how much of it is just 30 FPS making 2D games feel sluggish, in another step backwards while jumping functions identically to other M, which is basically the fusion wall jump with simplified controls, meaning infinite wall jumping is out of the picture. However, Samus Returns doesn't even allow you to wall jump up one tile wide shafts, and unlocking the space jump disables wall jumping altogether. Granted, it's basically redundant at that point, but combining the wall jump with the space jump was really satisfying in previous games. The end result is that I barely even use the wall jump in a normal run. This might not sound like a big deal, but the infinite wall jump in Super and Zero Mission was so much fun to incorporate into the rhythm of basic platforming. It's the exact kind of mechanical mastery that made those games so replayable. Rolling back to fusion wall jump physics deals a serious blow to the overall game feel and player expression, especially after Zero Mission had previously restored it. If the designers were really that concerned about preventing sequence breaks, they could have used spikes or that yellow honey stuff to corral the player's movement instead. Paradoxically, Samus Returns also has the most generous infinite bomb jump of any Metroid game I've ever played. In terms of innovations, over Zero Mission, holding L now locks Samus into an aiming mode, from which she can freely aim in any direction. The trade-off is that you can't move while aiming. Thankfully, the game is designed well around this limitation. Finally, Samus Returns benefits from being the first 2D Metroid game released on a dual-screen handheld, decluttering the top screen by moving the full map to the bottom screen. Strangely, the HUD has also been moved down there, which I think was a bad idea from a UX standpoint. Particularly during boss fights, I can't really afford to look that far down to check my health or ammo count, so I would have preferred those to stay on the top screen. What I do enjoy are the use of touch buttons for switching weapons, which is a convenient improvement over the select button from previous games. Samus Returns uses the stacked beam system from the GBA games, though now the ice beam and grapple beam are separately selectable. You can also tap the touch screen in the middle to activate the morph ball, which is useful, but would have fit better on the A button in my opinion. Interestingly, the ZL and ZR buttons do nothing on new 3DS, so why not map the morph ball there? Speaking of which, you might be wondering if the right analog nub allows you to aim while moving, and it doesn't. It just lets you pan the map while the game is paused, which you can already do with the circle pad anyway. Samus Returns innovates over other 2D Metroid games with two new systems, the first of which being this game's version of the synchronized block mechanic from Lord of Shadow. Basically, whenever this signal appears, you can press X with the right timing to counter the enemy, leaving them stunned and open to a counterattack. This is a mechanic I'm divided on. On one hand, I really like how it's integrated into boss battles. If you're quick enough on the draw, you can stun Metroids and score a bunch of free hits, finishing the fight that much faster. For normal enemies, however, I find that it just slows things down, especially in the early game. From a system design perspective, a melee counter doesn't really work unless every enemy is constantly lunging for you. This means you either need to free aim and take them down from a distance, which requires coming to a dead stop, or spam the melee counter on every enemy you see, which requires stopping to counter something every five steps or so. Either way, the result of the melee mechanic is that the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay can become lockstep and routine. That said, on the suggestion of a Twitter follower, I actually did a no melee run while recording other clips for this review. What I found is that if you really don't don't like the melee, you can safely ignore it. A solid strategy is actually to freeze enemies and immediately follow up with the missile. You can also shatter them with a melee if you're close enough or want to save on missiles. With a few exceptions, this will instantly defeat most enemies. Once I figured that out, the pacing picked up dramatically. However, the shatter strat does little to assuage the limited enemy selection. You'll be seeing the same horn nodes, snaggle tooth bats, fart snails, motos, and pooping bats for basically the entire game. Thankfully, the game introduces other enemy types later on which have more interesting behaviors. Autodes, for example, are heavily armored and can temporarily disable your Aeon abilities. And yes, it's pronounced Aeon. How do I know that? 
the phantom cloak can remain active after your aim has been depleted. There you go. Unfortunately, my favorite enemy from the original, the Sawblade Cactus, is nowhere to be seen. Rest in peace, you slicing succulent. Speaking of Aeon stations, this is the second major innovation in Samus Returns. Four brand new Aeon abilities that all share an energy bar and can even be used at the same time. You select these abilities using the D-pad and activate them with A. Personally, I would have put the Morph Ball on A and pressed an individual direction on the D-pad to toggle each Aeon ability. The abilities themselves are generally useful, and the fact that they're tied to the same energy bar forces you to develop a playstyle. Personally, I like 100%ing my Metroid games, so the scan pulse immediately became a new favorite. This ability reveals nearby areas of the map, including missing collectibles, which means no more looking up maps to find that last missile tank you're missing. The scan pulse also reveals nearby breakable blocks for a short time. Speaking of which, the map system in Samus Returns is easily the best yet. Not only does it feature everything from previous games, but there's also a convenient percentage counter on the map of each area. And you don't have to beat the game to unlock them either. It only took them three decades, but they finally got it right. The map also features multicolor pins like Castlevania to remind yourself to come back later, but honestly, I find it's faster to just wait until you have everything anyway. The other Aeon abilities are hit or miss. The phase drift acts as a replacement for the speed booster, slowing down time so you can bypass enemies and crumble blocks. This was a great ability that I wish I relied on more, but it consumes Aeon so fast that it's better to save it. My favorite ability is the lightning armor, which will expand the field of your melee counter and turn your Aeon gauge into a second health bar. Considering I prefer to tank enemies rather than stop to fight them, I found myself relying on it consistently. Finally, there's the Beam Burst, which has limited use but quickly obliterates tougher enemies. Personally, I only really use this ability when it's required. Even after 5 playthroughs, I still feel like there's more to the system I could master, which is a sign of a good gameplay addition. Regardless, the Aeon system is fantastic and easily the best innovation in Samus Returns. Similarly, the selection of boss battles is also pretty solid. The Metroid mini-bosses eclipse their Game Boy ancestors and surpass their aim to war alternatives. Metroids now have a defined set of attacks that are fun to dodge. What's more, you can still hit each form in the mouth if you need to, so you don't spend the entire boss fight awkwardly jumping around trying to hit the membrane. Ice beam shots now damage the forms as well, a convenient backup for when you're out of missiles. The beam burst works on Metroids as well, but I didn't learn that until I skimmed Wikitroid. My only complaint is that in Area 3 and 4, Gammas have a nasty habit of running away before you can finish them off. However, I learned from Twitter that you can actually destroy Alphas and Gammas in one hit, by firing a charged ice beam shot through three electric orbs and into the membrane. If you do this on the electric Gammas, you can prevent them from running away altogether. In the last episode, I had suggested adding an advanced strategy to each form to make them more compelling on repeat playthroughs, and this is certainly that. Nevertheless, I find that lining up a shot like this is much harder than it looks, especially since the Gammas like to spend so much time on the ground, so it's usually faster to fight the forms like normal. Speaking of electric Gammas, there are also fire versions of the Alphas and Gammas as well. Apparently, these forms have more health than the electric types, but other than the absence of the fast kill strat, the difference is mostly cosmetic. Oh, and apparently there's at least one fire type Zeta and Omega as well, but the health buff seems like the only difference. So what about the other boss fights? Arachnus returns from the original, now upgraded to a proper boss in line with its fusion appearance. I wasn't too keen on this boss, at least at first, but I eventually realized he has a decent bevy of attacks and a fast pace. It's just a shame the fight is so short. Meanwhile, the queen is a mixed bag. On one hand, she has a versatile attack set and a competent difficulty curve, and the use of the spider ball for defense was creative and unique. Despite all of that, the boss involved involves a lot of waiting around, and the queen can take out a shocking amount of your health bar just by touching you once. Thankfully, I learned from Wikitroid that the spider boost can cancel out her breath attacks and speed up the fight. I'm not sure how anyone was supposed to figure that out, but I'll take it. Additionally, similar to the original, you can enter the queen's stomach and lay bombs by countering her and grappling her tongue. Playing the boss with these techniques makes the fight a lot faster and more fun, making for the overall best queen fight of the three games. The Diggernaut is both the best and worst 
boss in the game. On one hand, it's challenging and forces you to master all of your abilities. On the other hand, the ASF used to teach the player how to fight the boss is poor, making for a bad first time user experience. This boss is basically Quadraxis from Echoes. You're supposed to spider ball around the boss and destroy bomb slots to damage it. Now, throughout the game, I got used to jumping against a wall and sticking to it in midair. So imagine my confusion when I tried this on the Diggernaut stationary arms, only to take damage for seemingly no reason. On further inspection, apparently these tiny brown rails can damage you even though they look like they're in the background. On my first playthrough, this tricked me into thinking I couldn't climb up the arms after all. So I spent a good 15 minutes trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. Once I figured out that yes, you can climb up but are only allowed to do so from the bottom, it's smooth sailing. But getting to that point was frustrating and left a bad first impression of this boss. On repeat playthroughs, I've grown to enjoy this boss a lot more. It has a creative, well-structured set of attacks that are fun to dodge, while also evolving in strategy as the fight progresses. Not to mention, it's fairly unique, and stands out in a franchise that prides itself on recycling the same boss characters over and over again. Overall, Samus Returns has a solid set of bosses, but the fact that there are only two new bosses is kind of a problem. In addition to reimagining the three bosses from the original game, Zero Mission introduced a host of new bosses to fight as well. Most of them were pretty easy, but I appreciated the effort. I would have liked to see Samus Returns add a brand new boss character for each area that didn't have one. Speaking of things that are easy, that's not how I'd describe the difficulty in Samus Returns. The damage increase to even the most basic enemies means that even on normal mode, Samus Returns is one of the hardest games in the series. Most enemies can take out half an energy tank just by touching you. And that's not to mention the bosses, which might even take out multiple tanks in one hit. Expansions are also smaller than in previous games. Missile tanks are only worth three, while power bomb and super missile tanks are only worth one. Interestingly, the expansion size doesn't change across difficulties. On my first playthrough, I found the difficulty frustrating since I tended to rely on tanking as I had in earlier games. On repeat playthroughs, I found the higher difficulty refreshing. I think most Metroid fans would agree that these games are generally easy unless you play on higher difficulties. So it's nice to play a Metroid game that's willing to punish you a little out of the gate. The overall design manages to hit the right balance of difficult on a first playthrough, but fast when you know what you're doing. If I do have any complaints about the balancing, the screw attack was nerfed slightly in this game. In previous games, the screw attack was a great late game weapon, allowing you to obliterate normal enemies while keeping your momentum going. While that's somewhat true for Samus Returns, there are enemy variants that require multiple screw attack hits to defeat, and others that are completely invulnerable to anything but the beam burst. I guess they were trying to prevent other weapons from becoming redundant, but I still think multiple hits undermines the point of the screw attack. Something that also annoys me is that replenishing your resources can be a pain in the butt. The original introduced recharge stations for health and ammo, which carried over to later games. By the Wii era, however, everything was folded into one convenient station, just like the Castlevania games. For whatever reason, Samus Returns reverts everything back to separate save, health, ammo, and AN stations. Not only is this redundant, but the stations are often found in very out-of-the-way places. If you ask me, this doesn't make the game more challenging so much as it makes it take longer. Longer. I say fold everything back into one station and be done with it. I will give this game credit for adding recharge stations to Area 7, seeing as I had complained about that when I reviewed the original. That pretty much covers normal mode, but what about the other difficulties? Beating normal mode unlocks hard mode, but in my experience, it doesn't really change much. For a start, the only real difference seems to be how much damage you receive from enemies. Enemies don't seem to get bigger health pools, and I didn't notice any new behaviors. As I mentioned before, Normal mode is already balanced to encourage dodging and discourage tanking. Seeing as the behaviors are the same, if you're good enough to finish normal mode, then there's not much hard mode can really throw at you. Just be more deliberate with dodging and countering, and you should be fine. Fusion mode is a little more interesting than the standard hard mode. Unlocking it requires spending $60 on the hatchling amiibo, though there are alternatives. <coughs> Samus is obviously wearing her suit from Metroid Fusion, which strangely has a much better looking model than the standard power suit. Unfortunately, the fusion suit is purely cosmetic. Fusion mode doesn't bring back the X-absorption mechanic, and there aren't any Korax mini-bosses. Granted, those features aren't exactly earth-shattering, but considering the lofty price tag for the amiibo, they certainly would've 
sweeten the deal. The real difference is that in fusion mode, enemies do even more damage than hard mode, and it's so high that you really can't afford to get hit at all. The good news is that Samus Returns does feature checkpoints before and after every boss, but that's not going to help you against regular enemies, some of which can take out several tanks just by touching you once. The Metroids are no slouches either, so you've better have mastered their attack patterns. Overall, I found that fusion mode started out frustrating, got slightly easier once you unlock the lightning armor, got really frustrating around area 3, and then got easier once you get the screw attack and the gravity suit. Overall, I didn't really enjoy fusion mode that much myself, but if you're looking for a real challenge, then you'll definitely get one. That only leaves the level design, which is difficult to summarize. I'll say right off the bat that the level design in this game is a definite improvement over Other M and even Corruption. However, at its core, Samus Returns is a remake of Metroid 2 and retains its compartmentalized design. The game is split into nine areas, regularly punctuated by Chozo Seals. Collecting all the DNA strands allows you to deactivate the Chozo Seals, lower the purple liquid, and continue on your journey. It's up to you how you want to route the area to kill all the Metroids and claim all the suit upgrades. Thankfully, the map system and scan pulse allow for more convenient navigation than the original, and there's even a radar that will blink as you get closer to your quarry. Simple, but very useful. Point being that, much like the original game, progress is fairly linear. Referring back to Zero Mission again, that game included a lot of intended skips, and was willing to let players collect upgrades out of order if they were good enough. By contrast, Samus Returns is strangely adverse to sequence breaking. I did find a few expansions you could get early using the IBJ, but these are few and far between. In my experience, almost every suit upgrade, including the beam upgrades, is required to finish the game, with Metroids being blocked by prominent progression gates. The only exception I could find on my own was the Space Jump, which you can easily skip if you can master the IBJ. It actually makes for a decent challenge run, particularly in the boss fights, and makes the wall jump significantly more useful than it is in a normal playthrough. I learned from my research that it's possible to skip the Spring Ball and the High Jump as well. These skips are difficult to pull off, but if I can do them, then you can probably do them too. Speedrunners have also discovered a host of out-of-bounds glitches, which could potentially skip certain suit upgrades. In my opinion, however, these are the worst kinds of sequence break, completely unintended by the developers, entirely situational, and finicky as all get out. Regardless, the game isn't quite as rigid as I originally thought. Moving on to the spatial design, eh? Going back to my Zero Mission review, I pointed out that in terms of layout, the size of each area was roughly one-to-one -one with the NES version, which made it trivial to recognize rooms and set pieces from the original. Despite making some changes to fit the map on one plane, AM2R was much the same way. When you compare each Game Boy map to its 3DS counterpart, you'll find each area heavily resembles the original and overall layout. But by golly gee, it sure doesn't feel that way when I'm actually playing it. I have to really strain my imagination to recognize a room as a counterpart to that of the original. Some of these changes are due to the introduction of new upgrades. Once again, seeing as the beams stack now, the beam tower in the original Area 6 doesn't make sense anymore, so the layout of the tower temple in Area 5 has been completely remodeled from scratch. Those are changes I can get behind, seeing as preserving the original layout wouldn't really make sense. Other changes, meanwhile, seem completely unmotivated. For example, one of the most memorable gamma encounters in Area 3 takes takes place in this vertical shaft. In Samus Returns, you fight this Gamma in a standardized room that looks nothing like the original. That ethos extends to most of the game. Any particularly memorable room layout or encounter I'd want to see recreated is missing in Samus Returns. Additionally, and I'm not 100% sure of this, Samus Returns just feels considerably larger than the original in some places. The only real exceptions I can point to after five playthroughs are Area 1 and Area 8. These areas have an expanded nearly as much as, say, Area 3 and 5. So it's much easier for me to say this room is supposed to be this room, that room is supposed to be that room, etc. As for the rest of the game, I'm racking my brain, poring over all the footage and consulting maps, but I'm having a hard time finding a single arrangement of platforms and enemies that carries over directly from the original game. With all that said, is this actually a problem? After all, I criticized the original for having a lot of samey 
or uninteresting room layouts. And I praised AM2R for replacing certain rooms with new layouts I found more interesting. Also, this game might have been attempting to be a reimagining, not a remake. Let's put a pin in that for now and assume this is a remake. While Zero Mission made major alterations to room layouts, these new iterations usually overwrote one of the many copy-pasted rooms, or at least evoked the essence of their original counterparts. There were also many, 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 many direct recreations of the original throughout the game to remind you of what you're playing. I'd argue this was true for AIM2R as well. I don't find that any of these justifications apply to the majority of Samus Returns. I had a hard time finding any recreations or homages to the original level design anywhere in this game. The fact that the world is so much bigger than on Game Boy just makes it feel different, full stop. Different or not, how is the level design in this game entirely on its own merits? Shoving aside my familiarity with both the original and AM2R as much as possible, I found that it's actually pretty good. While the layouts are all new, that means there's almost no repetition. Each room is fairly unique and stands out from the others. From a mechanics perspective, the skill training and mechanical escalation are excellent. No mechanic is ever abandoned or forgotten. For example, in Super and Echoes, the grapple beam is basically worthless once you unlock the space jump slash screw attack. In Samus Returns, not only do you use the grapple beam to swing across gaps, but you can also use it to hoist yourself up shafts or pull blocks, mechanics you'll be using well after unlocking the space jump. The puzzle design for expansions is great as well, making use of all your abilities for the whole game and always making you think. I especially enjoyed the addition of these turbines that suck away your bombs. Not to mention, there isn't a single shine spark puzzle in this game, so I don't have to complain about how bad they were. On that note, if there were any areas I'd want to see completely redesigned from scratch, it would be Area 7, now called Area 6. In previous videos, I criticized Area 7 for basically being a series of hallways and shafts where you walk and jump a bunch. Samus Returns definitely fixes that problem, creating a series of unique room layouts with more mechanical depth and substance, all the while keeping the Omega Ring Trap we all know and love. Similarly, Areas 4 and 5 from the original game have been combined into one area and overhauled substantially. If there's anything I dislike about the level design, it's that the pacing can sometimes drag. You'll recall from my Zero Mission review that I wasn't a fan of Chozodia, which was basically a giant serpentine hallway with no shortcuts. While nothing in Samus Returns ever gets quite that bad, there are a few sections in Area 3 and Area 5 that reminded me of it. Getting where you want to go always involves taking the long way around through several hallways or shafts, or sitting through elevator load screens. Thankfully, this game introduces teleport stations, which are helpful but could stand to be a little more common than they are. The size of the game world isn't so bad if you're playing normally, but if you go for full completion, you'll get a real taste of how big and difficult to navigate these areas can be. Unlike the original Metroid 2, there are tons of expansions you can't get without upgrades found in later areas. Because Samus Return still moves linearly from area to area, this means the fastest, most convenient approach to 100% is to wait until you've unlocked all your abilities, and then grab all the missing expansions in one run at the end. While AM2R had maybe two or three such expansions per area, Sam's Returns has roughly five or six. Couple the sheer number of collectibles with the bigger level design, and it took me roughly 90 minutes of non-stop playing to revisit every previous area and 100% Samus Returns, which is easily the longest cleanup of any 2D Metroid game I've reviewed so far. And the worst part is that the final boss is completely invulnerable to missiles and power bombs, so there's almost no endgame benefit to collecting all these expansions. To add insult to injury, someone thought it would be a great idea to take the crystal blocks that only appeared at the end of the Game Boy version and scatter them throughout the rest of the game. This means the game actively discourages cleaning up until after you've beaten the Queen. In the interest of fairness, during my hard mode run, I decided to see how much cleanup I could do before the Queen. And by my count, there are only four pickups that require the hatchling to collect. Most of the time, the crystal blocks are just shortcuts to help you get around or faster ways to collect pickups pickups that you can get by other means. So this means that you can clean up areas 2, 3, 4, and 6, fight the queen, and then go back for areas 1, 5, 7, and 8 afterwards. Either way, these crystal blocks aren't as bad as I initially thought. That said, Samus Returns exacerbates the trend from previous games of the lengthy 100% cleanup session at the end of the game. It's not as long as the Prime games, but it's getting there. 
So, remake or rebreak, how well does Samus Returns recreate and improve upon the original experience? Before we get to that, I want to discuss what I think of Samus Returns on its own. For various reasons, this review has been in pre-production for the better part of three years. I'd have to drop the project for months at a time, and when I finally came back, I'd develop a fresh perspective. Because of that, I played through Samus Returns to 100% at least five times over three years while producing this review. After all that, I I've come to one unavoidable conclusion. Samus Returns is actually a great game? Yeah, I may not have liked it that much during my first playthrough in 2017, but as it turns out, this game is way better than I remembered it. What's more, it only seemed to get better the more I replayed it. I was going to say that the soundtrack was bland and forgettable, but I realized it had more memorable tracks than I thought. I was going to complain about the graphics, but then I realized it had depthful backgrounds and a great use of stereo 3D. I was going to complain that there were no sequence break opportunities, but then I learned that there are actually a couple fun ones. I was going to complain about putting crystal blocks everywhere, but then I learned that only four pickups required the hatchling. I was going to complain about the melee counter, but then I realized that you can totally ignore it if you want to. I was going to write off all the level design, but after really examining it, I realized that it's actually really well constructed on its own merits. The only prominent flaw I could really mention is the the full completion experience, which requires a lengthy in-game cleanup session for which many pickups don't even help against the final boss. This game definitely has its flaws, but the longer I played it, the more I realized that the things I disliked either weren't as bad as I thought or were actually pretty good. That said, the more I've come to like Samus Returns on its own, the more I was convinced that it falls flat as a remake of Metroid 2. Remaster. I reserve this score for remakes that add new content or fix salient issues with the original, but don't reach their full potential as a remake or otherwise lack something meaningful that you can only get from the original. I think this describes Sam's Returns pretty well, because there are some notable improvements over the original. The opening cutscene looks great and does a nice job incorporating the story from the manual. The graphics, while not the best I've ever seen, definitely have more color and detail than the Game Boy version. The music adds more variety variety over the original with a few really solid remixes and even some great new tracks. Mechanics from later games have been rolled back into Metroid 2, and are well supported in the new level design, making for a more mechanically varied experience while preserving the mechanics from the original game. The Metroid mini-bosses have a more detailed and interesting attack set than both the original and AM2R, as does the Queen. I also appreciate the quality of life improvements like putting the map system on the bottom screen, map pins, the scan pulse, fast travel, and using the touchscreen to switch weapons. What's more, Samus Returns makes some worthwhile additions with multiple difficulties, the AN abilities, the Chozo memories, and even a couple new bosses. Unfortunately, this remake does have one damning flaw. It does not feel like Metroid 2. I realize that's a fairly subjective statement, but hear me out. For one, the visual overhaul goes too far in some places, overriding some of the most standout areas from the original such that they become unrecognizable. For another, with a few exceptions, a lot of the memorable music from the original game is either arranged in such a way that it sounds completely different or is replaced outright. Critically, while the level design fits in the same broad template as the original game, the content has been almost completely redesigned from scratch, making it very difficult to pick out rooms or set pieces from the original. In the last video, I contrasted Samus Returns with AM2R, calling the latter a labor of love that deeply respects its inspiration. My point wasn't that Sakamoto or Mercury Steam didn't care about Samus Returns. There's a lot of effort and great design on display, so it's certainly a labor of love in that sense. Rather, I don't get the impression that they were really interested in immortalizing the original experience with a faithful remake. You'll recall that Zero Mission went out of its way to include an emulation of the NES version despite considerable technical hurdles. Also, new players could still experience it and appreciate all the changes. Despite a 3DS emulation already existing for years at that point, Samus Returns doesn't include the original at all, not even as an unlockable. Apparently, the European Legacy Edition includes a download code for the eShop release, but as far as I can tell, this wasn't included in the North American Special Edition or the standard release. For what it's worth, Sakamoto has claimed in at least one interview that he respects the original game 
game even if he didn't work on it. But it's hard to escape the impression that the game is more interested in being a backdoor prequel to Metroid Dread than a faithful update on the original team's vision. Some of you might refer back to previous Remake or Rebreak episodes and argue that some of the games I've praised didn't feel like the originals either. So why am I criticizing Samus Returns for being unfaithful, but not any of those games? Where is the line between updating a game for modern sensibilities and turning it into something different entirely? First, allow me to revoke the replay score I gave to Super Mario 64 DS. I was overzealous and ignorant of the speedrunning community surrounding the original. Second, I'd argue that if there is a line, it's blurry and subjective. It's something I have to examine on a case-by-case -case basis. And in this case, replacing all the original level design is where Samus Returns crosses the line. Which brings me to an important question. Is this game actually a reimagining? I dispute that by pointing to the pre-release, where both Sakamoto and Nintendo referred to Samus Returns as a remake. For another, when I think of a reimagining, I think of Super Castlevania 4. That game shares its general premise with the first one. Simon Belmont is gonna kill Dracula. Otherwise, they're basically two entirely different games. But then again, I'm not sure that a remake and a reimagining are mutually exclusive. Just look at Zero Mission. That game literally remakes content from the original in some places and reimagines it in others. It's a difficult tightrope to walk, but it's possible to make a game that is both a faithful remake and an exciting reimagining. I'd argue that Samus Returns was attempting to do the same thing, but differs from Zero Mission in one important way. It takes too many creative liberties from the original, but sticks too closely to the overly linear structure of the original game. The result is too similar to be a great standalone reimagining, but just different enough not to be a faithful remake. Scored as a remake, I give it a remaster score. Scored as a reimagining, I give it a 7 out of 10. Scored on its own, I give it an 8 out of 10. But honestly, erring more on the side of reimagining may have been the best possible outcome. After all, AIM2R was already a faithful remake that adds and improves a lot of content while still feeling like the original Metroid 2. By making Samus Return so different, Mercury Steam's version carves out a unique legacy that makes it worth playing even if you've already played the other versions. On that note, it's time to crown what I consider the definitive Metroid 2 experience, AM2R Return of Samus. It has easily the best visuals of the three versions, its soundtrack has the best marriage of melody and atmosphere while excellently recreating the prime aesthetic, the story offers an impressive balance of lore and environmental storytelling while staying loyal to the Game Boy version, and the game feel is the smoothest and most satisfying of all three games. Most importantly, this game has fantastic level design that expertly balances recreating the iconic environments from Metroid 2 with more memorable puzzles, combat, and action set pieces that outpace the original game while remaining faithful. To give Samus Returns its due credit, it has the most balanced, engaging Metroid mini-bosses, the best map system, superior atmosphere thanks to the more ambient soundtrack, and a great core addition in the Aeon abilities. Personally, however, I value level design, pacing, and replay value the most when it comes to Metroid. And and in those arenas, AM2R wins hands down. But of course, that's just my opinion. I definitely recommend checking out all three of these games and coming to your own conclusions. If you were like me and didn't like Samus Returns on your first playthrough, I definitely recommend giving it a second chance. I think you'll find the game is better than you remember. With that, this three-part series finally comes to an end. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing to the channel for more in the future. I'd also recommend checking out the Inverse cast, where King K, Rirule, and myself talk about video games and play Sonic games. To be fair, <laughs> um, I wouldn't have a problem being royally f by f but we'll, we'll move on. Um, so, we recently did episodes in Sonic Frontiers and God of War Ragnarok, so check those out if you want to hear my hot takes. I'm still deciding what I want to do for the next review, but till then, I'm Exo Paradigm Gamer, and I'll see you all next time.